Hi, uh, my name is uh, Vahan Davudyan. I'm a physical experimentalist for 30 years. I have already posted or uploaded on YouTube 11 theories as follows. One, free falling objects by Vahan Davudyan, physical experimentalist. Two, attraction, gravity by Vahan Davudyan. Three, Earth's electric field. Four, gravity, the cause of attraction. Five, positive and negative charges, the theory of the separation of charges. Six, Earth's rotation in Regis University. Seven, new concept in DC motors. Well, of course, this is invention. I have to explain this later. Eight, radiometer further analysis by Vahan Davudian. Nine, induction, new concept without using magnets. Ten, Kepler's second law compared with pendulum on Earth, 11, which is today, general relativity simplified by Vahan Davudyan. First of all, I want to thank YouTube for this fabulous, fantastic opportunity for people so they can upload their whatever they want, science movies or whatever, and that makes a big difference. People learn a lot, and uh, it's amazing how they do it. And uh, to be honest with you, like two months ago when I started my science project, I, I finished it almost like in 2000, but uh, almost 2000 people watched for almost less than two months. That was a spectacular, that was so good. So anyway, I have to thank YouTube. YouTube is providing fantastic surveys. And then you can see I call the YouTube synapse. Synapse is the part of the human brain. It's like a junction and all the neurons are connected. The reason why I compared YouTube to synapses because it's connecting everyone. If I upload my theory somewhere and then they can read this, they can give me their idea so I can read them. That is amazing. I mean, how could they do this? I mean, they provide fantastic professional jobs and I appreciate that. So that's why I call them Mr. Synapses. And this is great opportunity for us. We can learn a lot. It doesn't matter how much I know in physics after 30 years, still I can learn. I can upload my theories. People can watch it. If it's good, they they love it, they responded, and they said their theories, I can watch it. So anyway, I love these theories, and you know, I love YouTube, and I appreciate what they're doing. Now, I have to start the general relativity, but I realized I won't be able to start it from 100 years when Albert Einstein was alive. You know, because in history, it's not good. You have to go back in history. Like, if you want to see how the Earth's work, you cannot say, like, 2,000, 5,000, 7,000 years. You have to go billions of years. You have to do reverse engineering. That's exactly what I did. I had to go back 500 years, and one of the greatest minds in the history of physics or astronomy is there was Copernicus. He was extremely smart, unlike Galileo. He did not mess with the religious people, authorities. He was safe but very smart person. So he said something profound. He said, relativity, you were talking about general relativity, not the special. He said, general relativity, it depends on where your location is. Our perception of the universe, our perception of the solar system, it depends on where we are. And I think he was absolutely right. Four or five years ago, we were in Portland, Oregon. That was one of the greatest phenomena in the history happened. And uh, people came from all over the world to Portland. There was no hotels and there was a chaos because people wanted to see. And that was passing exactly like uh, 80, 90 kilometers from Portland. And amazing, there was no hotels. People had to sleep in the street two days in advance because they were so excited. Unfortunately, something happened, we couldn't go, and then I said, wow, that is going to be bad, because I am not in totality. And so, you know, it's like a small area that if you're there, you can see 100%. Anyway, 
when the eclipse, solar eclipse happened, I filmed everything, I realized it's not 100%, it's almost 92%. And my friend filmed everything, he said, yeah, it, you know, temperature dropped 12 degrees, which is a lot. 12 degrees is a lot. And then it was so cold for a few minutes, people were so excited. So anyway, I will try to explain everything simplified. I'm not using any formulas, but I'm using a lot of experiment. And one of the most important thing in laws of physics is you have to be able to conceptualize, you have to be able to visualize. And unfortunately, general relative, relativity is a little bit counterintuitive. It says, yeah, in a space, Inertial mass and gravitational mass are the same. I said, well, it's not easy. It's a geometry. How could you imagine inertial mass and gravitational are the same? And I think Albert Einstein was absolutely right. They're both the same. So I said, what is the best way to do? I had to get help from my best buddies, which is Galileo and uh, Michael Faraday. He was one of the greatest minds in the history of physics. I mean, Galileo was amazing. I mean, he discovered everything after 2,000 years. And you know, I loved about the Galileo. He was disagreeing. That's why he promoted science. Almost like 2,000 years ago, Aristotle is right. You know, you have more mass, it accelerates more. And then he had to slow down everything on a ramp. And imagine, I was thinking all this. 20, 22 years, there is no way you can slow down anything unless if you have a ramp or inclined plane. And he was right. He did that a wooden ramp, and I don't know the acceleration was one or two meters per second square, I don't know. But overall, he did a good job because he had to put some bills, and then he realized something amazing. Acceleration is due to gravity is increasing, so it goes by time. And then he was right. And then I had to follow his ideas, but you know, I had to go one or two steps further. So I had to bend his ramp, so I had to find the plastic ones, and they have like four rays. So why did I do that? Because I could roll so many steel balls at the same time to see which one is accelerating, which one is decelerating, which one is getting more kinetic energy. Anyway, I show you. Okay, I have 10 more theories and the special experiments. I have never seen in any physics books. Some of these experiments are counterintuitive. I have some facts about Albert Einstein. His friends, contemporaries, is never been published. I have a lot of analogies, pictures, and experiments to explain. Everything about general relativity. If I go in public or universities or colleges and ask who did general relativity, maybe 70 percent will mention Albert Einstein. Nobody will mention Copernicus, Galileo, Henry Poincaré, Hendrik Lorenz, Fitzgerald, John Georg von Southern, Reimann, Hermann, Minkowski, German physicist John Georg von Sautner. And in fact, I have never seen his name in a science book, but he was so famous in the 19th century, and in fact, he came up with exactly the same thing Albert Einstein did 100 years later. But unfortunately, he is so unknown. So his name is physicist John Georg von Sutton. So for light bending, in 1804, he calculated the amount of deflection of light ray by a star. Based on Newton's corpuscular theory of light, the light would be diverted by heavenly bodies. He discontinued because the physics and astronomy in 19th century did not pay attention. René Descartes, curved and multidimensional space. Riemann's geometry for curved surface that led Albert Einstein gravity and curvature in space time. Hermann. Minkowski, that was his professor, proposed the space-time theory. The stage was set. They paved the road for Albert Einstein. Marcel Gossman, professor of geometry, helped with the mathematics and everything else. 
Michael Faraday showed an experiment, the interaction of light in a magnetic field, which laid the foundation for general relativity, Henry Poincaré, French mathematician. The most influential and self-educated person was Miss Emily du Chatelet, and she was one of the greatest physicists in history. With shocking similarities, she argued with Sir Isaac Newton, well, of course, he was not alive at that time, that your formula E is equal to mv is only for momentum. And she was right. And she mentioned it has to be E is equal to mv squared. Nowadays, that is the most famous formula for the kinetic energy. We call it Ek is equal to half of mass times velocity squared. Second husband of Emily, Volter, was a scientist and he was always having problems with French government. He was on the run. He saw an experiment by Dutch physicist William Gravesande. Dropping brass balls in clay, if velocity is doubled, the ball penetrates four times as much. She substantiated Gravesande by replicating and dropping the balls and then she realized that's absolutely right. If she is increasing the velocity by two, if kinetic energy is quadruple. She did not have college education, but was a great experimentalist. And the next person was Malawa, the first wife. And unfortunately, no one mentioned her contribution to general relativity. I saw a very old book, in, in like 100 years old, and they said, you know, her contribution was a lot. But somehow Albert Einstein did not want people to know that how much she helped. Even though she failed on a physics exam, but helping Albert in every aspect, typing and giving some ideas to Albert Einstein. Einstein was total failure in gymnasium, what they call it, the high school and college. But it was extremely, he was extremely intelligent to connect with latest innovations and inventions and theories. And in fact, I remember this was amazing when I was in high school. I used to write a lot for Albert Einstein and Werner Heisenberg and uh, Werner von Braun. And I don't know why, one day I realized I can call him Mr. Synapse. And you know, my, I mean, uh, Teacher said, I love that idea. I said, why did you call Mr. Albert Einstein synapse? I said, synapse is a junction in the human brain. It's connecting all the neurons together. So Albert Einstein was so amazing. He knew everyone. At that time, there was no internet, nothing. They would write down with all. And you know, he was making connection with everyone. I have never seen any books in the history of physics they write on about the Albert Ford, his special ability to, you know, connect with people. You know, of course, you know, some people say it's a plagiarize. No, I have to clarify that by the end of this speech. Vahan's logical analysis is, there is no action-reaction. In other words, the loss of inertia is out of equation. Whether I drop from 10 meters high or 100 meters high, acceleration is increasing proportionally. First second, the steel ball travels 4.9 meter. Second second travels 19.6 meter. Three seconds, it accelerates 29.4 meter. And four seconds, accelerates 39.2. This is called Galileo's uniformly accelerated motion. Bending light was not new. William Crook did this in 1800 in his vacuum tube. Then J.J. Thompson deflected the beam of electrons in vacuum tube. We cannot, we cannot perceive how fast the ball is falling. Of course, we can get a stroke photography and take pictures of falling ball. I came up with hypothetical or thought experiment for falling. Imagine I am jumping from 50 meters simultaneously, 1 kilogram and 10 kilograms are falling with me. If I push on one on 10 kilograms, I need more force to accelerate. 
because I am causing action reaction. So the laws of inertia comes in equation. This phenomenon can be on the surface of the earth. I am in a train, train is accelerating, I'm going backward. Train is decelerating, I'm going forward. Then I'll push forward. Sudden turns, I am accelerating to the opposite side. Laws of inertia. But when the train smoothly travels, there is no change in velocity, I don't feel anything. How do we expect a rocket outside the atmosphere or even in space accelerate and decelerate? The rocket needs some external object to push itself forward. Rocket is pushing its exhaust backward action and the exhaust is pushing the rocket forward reaction. Well, as you know, this is the third law of Isaac Newton. I have simplified as much as I could. I am not using a lot of formulas. Instead, a lot of experiment with pictures so you can visualize everything easily. For instance, it is counterintuitive to conceptualize Albert Einstein principle of equivalence I had to devise a special ramp, inclined plane also they call it, showing mass can become acceleration and acceleration can become mass. I also invented a special pendulum by incorporating Hooke's law with a harmonic oscillator or they call it pendulum. Also, I dropped some rods, you know, different shapes and then I realized it doesn't matter if that rod I'm dropping or if that the tube I'm dropping is oblique or 45 degrees, it keeps the orientation. And then I realized it's not causing any, earth is not causing any uh, torque on it. And even I got the accelerometer, I dropped it, it did not record anything. But as soon as you put the accelerometer on the earth, then it shows. I also invented a special pendulum by incorporating hooked law with a harmonic oscillator, that's what I said, exactly like dropping accelerometer. So it doesn't show any acceleration. Galileo's relativity encompasses Albert Einstein and Henrik Lorenz because Galileo was extremely smart. I mean, it was so simple to understand his relativity. He said, if you want to see if you're moving, you know, you have to have a frame of reference. And he was absolutely right. So you have to have a frame of reference. If you are in a car, you know, the windows are closed and the car is not moving, and you never know, or if it's moving so smoothly, you cannot tell. Because you don't see outside. You can't have any frame of reference to it. You know, the best example is to say, I am walking three miles per hour. I am not, cannot walk in space. I'm walking on the surface of the earth. So my frame of reference is what? Earth. So if I don't have that frame of reference, I won't be able to do anything. All my theories are substantiated as much as I could with, uh, uh, you know, mostly, I would say, experiment. And I had this good habit when I started like 30 years ago. I would read, you know, all this experiment. If it, not, if it wasn't beyond my expertise, what I could do, I could just photocopy and then make sure I go step by step and then replicate everything. And amazingly, I found that, you know, not only I could do those experiments, I found three of them that was great ideas, that was breakthrough in science. And imagine a once Christian Orster was a little bit absent-minded professor. And unfortunately, he didn't do it, the, you know, the student did. He was in a class, you know, doing some, something, and then the boys rushed in the class and said, Sir, sir, come over, we have something. And then the compass was on the desk, and somehow some of those students turned the lights on, and then one of the greatest phenomena happened in the history of mankind, electric, electricity magnetism, we call it electromagnetism. So he came over and watched it, yeah, that is why. And then he was so smart, then uh, he just analyzed, he realized it has to do with the current. 
and uh, Maxwell came over, he formulated it, and uh, imagine how, I mean, how far the science goes. I mean, how could they know? Because most of these accidents, of, uh, I mean, uh, inventions happen by accident. And I remember when I was uh, in women's school, I remember Louis Pasteur was my favorite micro uh, biologist. And once he said, the chance only favors prepared mind. And you know, Hans Christian Orsted was a physicist. His mind was prepared. How could you expect Alessandro Volta not to come to conclusion or not to uh, analyze when Luigi Galvani had a dead frog and then they twitched the dead frog's leg? And the poor man had no idea because he was a doctor or, you know, he was, uh, uh, you know, doing some uh, high setting on a frog. He had no idea why that happened. And even Alessandro Volta didn't know that because Linus Pauli were are going to be born in another hundred years. He was one of the greatest scientists in the United States. He got two Nobel Prize anyway. He came up with this fantastic idea they call it the Linus Pauli scale. And imagine, I give you two examples. Copper is 1.9, zinc is 1.6. If you stick them in water or if you stick them anywhere in the soil and then you get a multi meter it is going to show one meter, I mean one volt. Well, of course that one volt is not going to light up any light because as you know, you need quintillion charges to go in one second to make one ampere. But at least that one volt is a Henry Lorentz forces it shows. Anyway, so all this, all this in the history, it goes to the prepared mind. And then I said, well, when the earth is good conductor like this, I had to do something genius. I had to get some uh, microwave ovens and then remove their coils and then I measured with great precision. It was exactly five kilometers. It was real fine water, I mean fine wires. And then uh, it is creating like a coil uh, that the high voltage in microwave. And uh, I said, I have to test this. So I got two of them back to back, it takes exactly 10 kilometers. And then I had one zinc, one copper, I stuck them in the mud, and then I realized I can get one volt. When I connect those 10 kilometers, guess what? Only 10%, only 0.9% I had voltage. And that is amazing. How could that travel in Earth so good? And then I realized, despite the hybrid Perception always, you know, young generation the well, you have to have electrons. No, in soil, you don't need electrons. It's ion. It's hydrogen plus ions in soil, in water, and things like that. So practically, if you think, they are also conducting electricity. Now, I'm going to have to remove this a little bit and then start my uh, ramp. And uh, like I said, these ramps are so special and uh, I had to, uh, I mean, uh, modify Mr. Galileo's ramp completely. I mean, right back. I have to adjust it camera a little bit because I won't be able to demonstrate everything so I have to go down a little bit and then you can see my uh, you can see my ramps So, these are special ramps, but I will explain exactly how they work. Let me double check, make sure we can see the whole pictures. Yes. 
In fact, Galileo's was so different. See, my ramp is special, it's called V-shape. Galileo was only one side. If I'm not mistaken, it was like two meters high and then probably six or seven meters long. But he was genius because he discovered something which was unbelievable. I mean, it's beyond my imagination. The first laws of ocean and everything else. And then he realized when the balls like this, these are fantastic balls, these are brass, these are steel, but he had to use brass at that time. I think steel was not there at that time. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But these steel balls are so good, they're brand new, they don't bubble, and the precision is almost 100%. Because I used to roll some plastic balls, and guess what? They wobbled. The reason why the distribution of mass is not good. But here, see, these are fantastic. You see how good they roll, how smooth they roll back and forth. And this is a special plastic. They use it for doors. It's extremely sharp. So why did I use two rows? The reason why I could compare two back to back or side by side to see which one is getting more kinetic energy. So Galileo, what he did, he could find out exactly the acceleration, is half of the acceleration. That is called the, his uh, uniformly accelerated ocean. That you know is half of the acceleration times time squared. And then what I did here, I had to find two ramps, and this ramp is exactly 50 centimeters square. That one is one meter per second square. So what I did, I had balls like this, steel balls like this, so I had to roll this and then get elastic collision. Why did I do that? So I just wanted to see how much does it accelerate. And it was exactly 50 50 centimeters. And then I came up with the genius idea here. I said, what if I go ahead and increase the velocity or increase the acceleration to the gravity double, double, but instead of 112, I get only 56. But I show you exactly how important these ramps are because it is multi-purpose. Look, see? There is no way that you can see if you free fall, what happened to these things? No way! Pendulum and ramps are the only way in the universe you can find out how much they travel. So why the small one is lagging behind? There's a science behind it. Because by the time it gets here, kinetic energy is converted to gravitational potential energy, and gravitational potential energy is converted to kinetic. But according to kinetic energy formula, the mass is less. And then the another juice. See, after that, stop the little one, 28 grams. This one is going to go almost like two minutes. But I'm not going to do that because we don't want to wait down. See? And immediately after a few, they go out of synchronization. So this one is so different. So I just wanted to tell people that mass can become acceleration and acceleration can become mass. So here we have mass. But that mass is moved over there and this is acceleration, is more. See? Let me show you how good here goes. Look. See? You see the acceleration? You can feel. If you drop two together, you can see they go out of sync. They go out of sync immediately. Look, see? See, it's falling behind. Because in fact, I realized after this year, I mean, it's been like 20, 22 years I did this, I realized the main purpose, the main force behind this propelling the ball the opposite direction is not gravity, it's all kinetic energy. So it's a conversion of kinetic energy to gravitational potential energy and gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy. But unfortunately, there is a problem here, and I'm not going to pay hundred thousand dollars to make vacuum because in science they say always your theories 
might be thermodynamically closed. What it means that, you know, the outside influence should not be there. And I think they're absolutely right. But how could I do that? Even the sound is back here. So we have friction. See those? How sharp they are? So we have friction. So every time that 56 gram is moving, is moving some air, is doing some work. So you can see the period is back and forth. It's exactly like this pendulum. It's going back and forth. So every time it goes, what happened? It's getting smaller and smaller. The reason why focus pendulum work in uh, Paris, because he was genius. He was one of the greatest minds. Because it was amazing. He was so huge. He was so high. But you know, when I did this in Regis University, mine only would take 165. But, uh, Focus pendulum goes all the way to 360. The reason why at mass was amazing. I mean, the bulb was huge. My bulb was only 50 grams. So anyway, you see what happened? Now, my conclusion was like this. If I accelerate this with half of this, so this is exactly half. If I can accelerate this half with the same amount, so my idea is right. Mass becomes acceleration, acceleration becomes mass. And you see what I did? I was, you know, I used one meter on each side and they graduated. And wherever they stop, I can tell exactly how much they accelerate. So let me accelerate this, you can see. See? Exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. But if you do the opposite, see what happened. Look, see? This has less mass, and of course it does make sense. By the time it gets here, it has a lot of kinetic energy, but because the mass is less, it's not going to accelerate that much. Look. Did you see what happened? Did you see what happened? So this is the way, and then I said, yeah, mass becomes acceleration, and acceleration becomes mass. Well, of course, I have more, and uh, like I said, these two devices in physics are so important. See, this is pendulum, and then I have to use a uh, fine uh, swinging bulbary from the computer, and this is exactly 150 grams. And look, see, that it doesn't matter how small or big the amplitude is, time is not changing. I mean, how could you expect someone in, in medical school, two years, one of the greatest mind, genius, he was in a church and then the chandelier was going back and forth, he rushed home. I mean, how genius he was. Can you tell? Now we got clock, we got internet, we got electricity. At that time, there was not, nothing. Clock had not been invented yet. But because he was genius, he was in medical school two years, he got his pulse. And then he realized the amplitude is not changing. And in fact, this is one of the greatest inventions of the humans because it's called harmonic oscillator. Well, when I studied electronics, I remember in atomic and subatomic level is the same way. There is a famous circuit called tank circuit and then it's a capacitor and inductor. So it's a discharging, charging, discharging, charging. And what happened after a while, even though it's in subatomic and atomic level, they lose because the atoms are hitting, you know, they got kinetic energy and so and so. And there is no way that you can sustain the oscillation. And then immediately you go back to second law of thermodynamic. Second law tells us that, you know, it's an error of time. But overall, any time you have motion like this, this is going to go, not forever. Finally, the friction will stop it. But you know, the second law is so important, it's so fundamental. It says it's an error of time. Every time you have a motion, entropy increases. So what it means, this pendulum is going back and forth, and every time the swing is getting smaller. This ball is going up and down, and due to air friction, what happened? It's a slowing down. 
So that is the reason why you cannot see perpetual motion because even if you have pendulum like this, you have to put a magnet or something or the electric motor or something activated so it will go forever. Well, of course, there is one exception. Uh, unfortunately, we don't want to mess up your mind. The only exception is that, you know, the solar system and beyond, I mean, we have Earth rotating for millions of years. We have Mars, and then we have uh, Jupiter, and then we have like, uh, everything. I mean, those are going forever. That is the only exception. But Michael Faraday, what he did with the electric motor, and that was my favorite while I was so young. I used to make electric motors and sell them to students in high school. I made a lot of money. And after 191 years, still we're using the same principle. Michael Faraday's electric motor did not even look like an electric motor. But he was genius. And I don't know why they accused the poor man for player, you know, plagiarizing. He did not plagiarize. That was his own idea. Because, you know, he was smart enough, he just published it.